the old fashioned wedding vows say, say if there's anybody here that objects to to this union, speak now or forever hold your peace. And of course, who's going to be the jerk that speaks up, right? I mean, it's like it's like a rhetorical question. I've been on a few weddings or Whoa. seen a few weddings where Somebody that's happened. Oh, absolutely, Whoa. bro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, everybody. Welcome again to the podcast, Ask Me Anything. This is a podcast where you get to ask and we address questions that have been on your heart, maybe that you didn't have the courage to ask, have always wanted to ask, maybe just regular things, maybe bizarre things. You could ask us anything. My name is Frank Santora. This is my co-host, Ronald Julian. Welcome to the conversation. What's going on, Pastor Frank? How you feeling, man? I'm feeling pretty good. What's up, man? Football season is here. Oh, yeah. Your Cowboys yeah. fan, you know. I know what I'm doing on Sunday. Yes, sir. Well, Sunday, besides Sunday, preaching, Sunday. right? Sunday, Sunday is my football makes Sunday. Yes, even better than it is. Yes, I mean, Sunday is normally really, really good because um, I would prefer being in church than, than anywhere else. Um, so you come to church, um, and then after church, you you go right home, and you have your Sunday mm-hmm. macaroni. And meatballs. It's very specific, man. Oh, every Sunday, macaroni and meatballs, every single Sunday. And um, just, I mean, the gravy cooks all day. And then you get dipping the bread in there, put a little rock on wait, top. Wait a minute. I, I, mean, I feel like ooh, you're going somewhere else. Let's stay focused, man. Well, I, feel like you, man. I feel like you're entering into Oh, yeah. And then football. And then football. <laughs> and then you, you, you eat this big dish of pasta when you're watching football. And the great thing about football for me is the Cowboys are always on, bro. They are. I mean, you don't ever get to see the Saints because nobody cares, but we get to watch the Cowboys every single week. You know what? Let's move on to our, our first right, segment. Right. Before we do that, though, <laughs> let's 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 ask the question. What's going on in Pastor Frank's life? What's what's happening in your life? Well, man? Um, one good thing and one bizarre thing. First, let me start with the good thing. So I'm, I teased this last week, but I just came out with a with a new book. This is actually my first leadership book. It's called Leadership Unlocked God's Way. Awesome. And, um, you know, a lot of people ask, well, what's, what does that mean, God's way? If you can lead in the church, which is a organization where people don't have to follow, right. um, which is a place where many times you're, you're leading people who aren't getting a paycheck. If you can lead in the church, you can lead anywhere. And so what I thought about was I thought about how can we take some of these principles over 30 years of, of, of leading in the church and share them with people so they can use them in any arena of life. Mm-hmm. And so there's mm-hmm. some there's some amazing things in here. Um, matter of fact, um, one of the things that's in here is called the leadership fee, F-E-E, because there's a price that every leader has to pay. Yes. Um, and you've heard that before, but I go over the specific cost to leadership, just one of the little things that'll help equip people to become better leaders. And so they can get this anywhere um, right now. Um, go to Amazon, go to our uh, our website, Frank San- franksantora.cc, um, Faith Church website. You can get it anywhere, and it'll be a blessing, blessing to you. So that's the good thing that's happening, First Leadership Book. The, the other bizarre thing that's happening is I heard about this wedding. <laughs> I heard about this wedding where... <laughs> I mean, there was an all-out brawl, and and I found out that the reason why there was this all-out brawl at this wedding is because I think it was a bridesmaid stood up and said, "You were just with me last week." Yeah, yeah. I well, was like, "Whoa, <laughs> what is that? Is that is crazy, man? Yeah. Oh, that's like Jerry Springer Bro, type stuff." Let me tell you. So, for those of you that don't know, um, um, I'm not just a campus pastor, but I'm also a worship leader, a musician, and and throughout my life, I've probably sang or played for hundreds if not thousands of weddings um across the country and every now and then you, you'll get uh some fireworks Ooh, that's and, fireworks yeah, right and, there and this one particular wedding uh and it, but it wasn't the bridesmaid it was actually a a, a, a actual member a, you know person that was just attending um the wedding my story's better <laughs> somebody close <laughs> <laughs> so she stands up you know at the at the point of does anyone have any reason as to why these two shouldn't be married she wow. she stands up and she says i do uh, and you know you were with me last week Ooh. and bef- all their business before the pastor could wrap his arms around what was happening 
Uh, three of the bridesmaids had taken off their earrings and their shoes, and they were making a beeline. Wow. For, it was almost like they knew her. Wow. You know, and it was just an all-out brawl. The families wow. were fighting. The the, the, the the congregants were fighting. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was, I, it was I've, seen, I've seen that kind of stuff on Jerry Springer. Yeah, it, it did feel kind of Jerry uh, actually, Springer-ish. Actually, um, I talked about my, my first leadership book. My, I already know what my last book that I'll ever write is going to be. Okay. Um, I've pastored now um, as a lead pastor for going on 27 years and, and as a full-time pastor for 31 or 32, I always forget. But uh, my last book is going to be What Does the Church and Jerry Springer Have in Common? Mm. Because I've seen some crazy stuff yeah, even yeah. in the body Thousand percent, thousand percent, man. So yeah. that's what's going on, man. That story blew me away. That's what's up, man. That's what's up. So, um, but here's here, here's the the next question, though. Did you hear? Um, what's happening in the world that's been k- keeping your attention or has caught your attention in the world of church, in the world of sports, in the world of government politics? Wow. So, um, can I just tell you, I hate politics. Yeah. Um. You know, I'm at a place in my life where I can't watch it anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, it is. Yeah, me too. I don't know if anything is authentic anymore. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just crazy. It is so, so uh, one-sided. Um, you never know what the truth is. You're yeah. always having to sparse through what actually happened, what didn't actually happen, what is spin, what is not spin, all that kind of stuff. And and I just won't watch it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I am i don't mean that I, I don't think Christians should not be engaged because um, I think if we don't, if we don't, if we aren't engaged, then we are basically, we have no right to then criticize the process. Right. Um, but I, I can't stand it anymore because um, it's just gotten to the point where you don't know what to trust. And so people always ask me, well, well, how does that how does that affect the way I vote? I said, look at what the Bible says and vote for the person because nobody in politics, I uh, maybe maybe that's an overrated example, is going to be a perfect person in any way, shape, or form. Vote the person who mostly matches what the scripture says. Yeah. That's it. So that's been that's because we're we're, we're in that season now. So it's, oh, yeah. it's like you know you you you're tempted to kind of look at it, mm-hmm. and then I try for like for like three four minutes, and I want to vomit. Yeah, I mean I, it's yeah. just like come on, what is going on with this mess? Yeah, the mud the yeah. mud slinging is oh, being thrown, yeah. man, and we have to be yeah. careful as Christians that we don't get caught up in that. We're called yeah. to be a light, even in this. Yes, even even in fulfilling our patriotic duty, yes. we're called to be yes. a light. Yes. And yes. So yes. no matter where you're political affiliation lies, you know, the Bible says, that's for me and my house. We will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And that's, that's right. where we stand. So uh, thank you for sharing, sh- sharing that, man. So uh, we're, we've been talking about this, this conversation around um, um, infidelity mm. um, and, and, and restoration. Right. And so we're going to kind of pick up the conversation because it was really good last week. And that's why that story about, you know, what happened at the wedding really just Hit me because that's our conversation. <laughs> that's like, our conversation. Yeah. How, do, how do you come back from that? How do you come back? Actually, how do you come back? You Can know, you come back? That's actually that's actually um, a good thing, though. That's like a blessing, right? A thousand percent. Um, God was blessing that couple because uh, if that's the way you're going to start off, then you shouldn't even start off. Yeah. Right. And and that's a lot of what happens with people, right? Is they they start off on the wrong foot. Yeah. Thousand um, percent. But I think it's it's really important too that we understand sort of like the context. I'm going to push a little bit, a little bit you know harder uh, in this area because there are a lot of marriages who are experiencing um, the, the the fruit, one of which being infidelity, because there is a breakdown that's happening long before the fruit is manifested in these ways, right? I mean, and they're, and they're and let's let's just go there. Sometimes, you know, people are not sexually satisfied. Yep. They're not being feeling satisfied. They're not feeling um, seen uh, as a as a as a person or loved intimately in other ways. There's no romance. There 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 are no things. But there's also all of the different challenges of life. We've got kids. We've got two parent household, yep. working income. You know, working jobs. You know, how do you navigate all of that to get to a point of saying, hey, I'm feeling unfulfilled mm. what, what does that look like well first of all i think that what you just said is is probably the uh, the godly way of dealing with it is to have the conversation before somebody commits infidelity yeah and so you know if you're watching and you're you're in this category where your marriage has experienced some drift um 
You don't feel that connection anymore, whether it's um, on an emotional level or an intimate level. And usually they're, they're related to one another, right? Usually um, if there is intimate connection on an emotional level, there's, there's intimate connection on a, on a physical level. Right. And it's usually when, when we're not meeting there that we feel unfulfilled uh, sexually in, in our marriages. Um, but having the conversation first is usually what people won't do. Mm-hmm. For whatever reason, um, and there are some reasons, people feel as though it's, it's pointless and it's useless to have the conversation. And so we quit on the conversation. But um, that's the enemy, really, in our lives, trying to get a foothold. The Bible yeah. says give the, give the enemy no place, no place in your life. Don't give him a foothold. And what happens is, is when we get to the point of exasperation and frustration where we, where we think, what's the point of having this conversation? The enemy has won. And so we have to brave through those feelings of, but we've already discussed this before, um, it, it never goes well, um, I'm never heard, and we need to find out how can we have a conversation where we are heard, and, and many times that involves involving somebody else in mm-hmm. the conversation. Um, when two people know each other so well, um, it's difficult sometimes for them to hear each other. Right. And you need somebody that's a third party sometimes. And, and the Bible talks about this to, to confess your faults one to another. Yeah. And, and, and so we have to understand that even in our marriages and in anything in our relationship with, with the Lord, there is a certain amount of vulnerability that we need to have with um, a small group of people in our lives mm-hmm. who we, we entrust to help and speak into our lives. And everybody made fun of the Hillary Clinton statement years ago. Um, and whether you're a fan of hers or not a fan of hers, I mean, I don't mean to get political, although I guess I just did. Um, she did bring up something that she didn't invent, but she said it, and it was, it takes a village to raise a child. Um, and there is some truth to that. Sure. There is some truth to that. Um, matter of fact, there might be a lot of truth to that. And sometimes it takes a village to, to keep a marriage strong. A thousand percent. In, in our wedding vows... We, we talk to the witnesses. Yeah. And, and um, the old-fashioned wedding vows say, say, if there's anybody here that objects to, to this union, speak now or forever hold your peace. Mm-hmm. And, of course, who's going to be the jerk that speaks up, right? <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like a rhetorical question. Although I've been in a, two, you in, have been? In a, I've been in a few weddings or Whoa. seen a few weddings where Somebody that's happened. Somebody spoke Oh, up? absolutely, Whoa. bro. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's happened. And I think, listen, I won't go down the rabbit hole of what happened because fights happened. Police got called. Ooh, I've never been to any of those oh, bro, weddings. It, it was, it was, it was uh, especially to be the one singing and playing the piano, you know, being the, the artist at the wedding and singing. That's from not a, like a redneck wedding, is it? <laughs> 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 Everybody fighting hey, with one hey, another. I'll, I'll, although, listen, I'll tell you, there's, there's a famous, there's a famous TV show. It's called The Different World, and one listen, of the I, I'm listen, very bro, familiar you, with yeah, the show. Yeah, yeah, that you know, Whitley and Dwayne. Uh-oh. You know, when he spoke up for his girl and got Uh-oh. his, you know, at the, you know. But I'm not, I'm not suggesting that be the case. You know, get all that stuff sorted out before before the wedding day. Yes, but um, but you're right. But it it, it happens, and I, and I think um, when we talk about the 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 way forward or the way to 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 make sure that we don't um, get ourselves in these situations in the first place. It, I think it even starts before marriage, yeah. you know, having people around you that can help you to see. Cause when you, you know, when you're dating somebody, you're, you're in love, the emotions are running butterflies in your stomach, all these different things are happening, yes. but you, you need to have some people that you trust that can yeah. see what you can. Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, that old, I, I think it's a famous poem. Love is blind, but the neighbors ain't <laughs> love is blind. So don't make love by the garden gate. Yeah. You ever remember that? I know, uh, I, know, I know the first part, not the second part, though. <laughs> <laughs> that must be an old an old saying, right? <laughs> That's the unchristian version of it, by the way. You, you were a church boy more than longer than I was a church boy. You grew up as a church boy. I just became a church boy as I grew up. Um, but but anyway, um, what Basin is telling us is that love is blind. And, and, and the classic story of that in the Bible is, is Samson and Delilah, isn't mm-hmm, it? Mm-hmm. Um, Samson couldn't see the person that he was with was bad for him. Yeah. Um, and, and conversely, he was bad for her too, but, um, he couldn't see that. And that's why we do need people in our lives and, uh, who, who, who can speak into our lives, who we can listen to and kind of 
just kind of going back to at the wedding, we, we say to the witnesses in, in the modern version of the ceremony, I, I speak to them all as, you know, where two or three agree, the scripture says that, that God is in their midst. Mm-hmm. And, and I tell them, you're here to add your agreement to this union, but also to add your support on an ongoing basis that if you see anything happening in this union, you're the closest to them. You're the, you're the, you're the friends of the friends, especially the bridal party. So what are they there for? They're there to speak into in a healthy way, not to butt in, Mm -hmm. not to stick their nose where it doesn't belong, but they're there to speak into the life. And so in order to sometimes get over those, um, I don't want to talk about it. We've been down this road. We need to have that, that other party that, we're, we're willing to be honest with, and we're willing to listen to. Yeah. And that's the hardest part because I found I do a lot of marriage counseling and done a lot over the years. I think I've been pastoring now between lead pastor and, and associate pastor for almost 30 years, maybe a little bit more than that. I know I still look like I'm in my 20s, but that's beside the no, point. No, you, you look like um, you've been pastoring for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. 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 You will be in the message this weekend, I promise you. <laughs> um, now you threw me off my game right my there. Bad, I, don't, I don't even remember what I was what I was saying. Oh, I've done a, done a lot of marriage counseling and one of the things that that is hard for some people is to hear what hurts. Yes. And the scripture says faithful are the wounds of a friend. Mhm. Um and a friend loves at all times. So a friend is there, good times and bad times, but a true friend is going to call somebody out, not for the sake of shame and embarrassment, not for the, 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 the sake of, of, of making them feel less than, but for the sake of uh, getting to a healing place. Yeah. And um, sometimes in order to, to heal, um, we have to experience what hurts. Mm-hmm. And um, so that third person, that accountability in the situation to be able to be vulnerable with. And, and everybody wants to choose their counselor. You know, it's like, like well, I, well, I've seen people say, the husband will say, well, I really trust and like this person. And the wife will say, well, I don't really trust and like this person. And, and, and then what happens is you wind up going to like somebody that you don't even know, which, which I get, it's helpful in some ways. But I think life works better when we have people in our lives who are trusted mentors, pastors, spiritual advisors, who we know love us. 100%. Have our best interests at heart, are not going to tell us something to to get on one side or the other side, but are going to tell us because they want to make it through, want us to make it through to the other side. 100%. And I think, you know, you kind of hit on something you talked about the bridal party, like it's not just about having pretty dresses or nice tuxedos on is that you're agreeing to yes. bear the weight of the responsibility yeah. of, of pushing these two individuals, one towards God, but ultimately back towards one another, Absolutely, you know, not just to look good for a day, Absolutely. you know? And so that's, that's something that we should all kind of take away for all of my young people out there who are looking to be married and you're picking your bridal party. It should be people that are rooting for you, people yes. that are wanting you to win, um, not just that want to look nice for a day. Absolutely. You know, that's some good stuff, man. That's some really, really good stuff. Deep stuff. Deep yeah. stuff. So now we're gonna we're gonna transition now to our real life react. This is where we look at a real and we do uh, we haven't looked at it before. Yep. And we're gonna Let give our initial impression, our reaction. So this one is uh let's let's check it out. Love this stuff. No other sin so clearly affects the body. As this one done, you said that sexual sin is different. Yes, it does, girl. Paul just Paul just co-signed for you. All sin is sin, and this one hits different for a reason. It's your body. When you stole a cookie from the cookie jar, you didn't steal a cookie from your body. You didn't even steal a cookie from somebody else's body. But when somebody got your cookie, that's your body. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. That's why it hits different. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who lives in you and was given to you by God, you do not belong to yourself. That's why you can't share yourself. That's why promiscuity is wrong. Why? You don't belong to you. So how are you going to share you? You don't belong to you. You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Listen, y'all. Wow. Ooh, boom. Yeah. I yeah. mean, he really hit that. Uh, yeah. That's, that's, that's good stuff. You know, um, 
people people often say all sin is is the same, and from a separation from God point of view, that is true, right? Um, no one sin will separate you more from God than another sin, uh, and so from that theological vantage point, it's a very true statement. Yeah. But the scripture does specifically say um, and put sexual sin in a different category. And for the reason that this, this gentleman said, because it is against your own body. Um, and, and, and I think, and we, we touched on this last time, part of the reason why sexual sin is, is just different is because of the power that it has. Yes, yes. Right? It, it has extraordinary power. Um, when you see two 14-year-olds break up, and they, they act like they have just dissolved a 20-year marriage. And they're, they're like in their bedroom. Um, not that this was me at one point in my life. They were, uh, they sounds they were in, sounds they pretty, were, uh, pretty they're, personal. They're in their bedroom and, and, you know, they're going through boxes of Kleenex yeah. and, they, and they won't come out. And, you know, and, and they're moping around, everything like that. You know that sexual sin has taken place. Yes. Um, because what sexual sin does is it joins two spirits mm -hmm. together. The Bible says is not someone who uh, has sex with a prostitute joined yeah. to that prostitute. Uh, let, let, let no man divide asunder what God has joined together. The joining here is the merging of spirits. And what makes sexual sin so so challenging and so difficult is the power of how it brings two spirits together and then when that that union is broken those spirits are ripped apart yeah um it's not the flesh that gets ripped apart even though it does and it's not the flesh that is painful see what we don't realize about about pain is that real pain happens at a spiritual level it doesn't always happen at a physical level physical pain is something that everybody endures and deals with but it's easier to come back from sure. from from root pain or spiritual pain where most of the issues are and this is why we don't need a a a how do I want to say this a fleshly savior although we or we came in the flesh um, and and I hope maybe I should clean it up Theologically, but I think everybody understands what I'm talking about. We have it. We need a savior who came to save our spirits. Yeah. Right? He came so that our spirits can be made whole because we are spirit beings, right? Yeah. We're, we, yes, we are fleshly beings, but we are spirit beings that possess a soul and live in a body. And when we leave this earth, our, our body remains here. Our spirit goes on. And our spirit is the part of us that needs to be healthy. And to really live the kind of life that God has designed for us, we need to have healthy spirits. So what happens with, with sex outside of God's context, is it pollutes the spirit. It's really the preferred weapon of the enemy that the enemy has used to mar God's creation ever since the beginning of time. I think last time I mentioned in passing, and for those of you that are like biblical uh, scholars and nuances, there's a whole book on this called the Book of Enoch. The Book of Enoch is not considered to be a, a canonal, uh, what's the right word for canonized. it? Canonized. Yeah, canonized book. book. It's, not, it's not considered authentic scripture, but it is considered to be historically, you know, gleanable, if you will. Mm -hmm. And it all talks about how the, the sons of uh, God... Or and the daughters of men, and means fallen angels and 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 real life human beings. Yes. Uh, the fallen angels had intercourse with with the uh, the daughters of men, and how this polluted the entire human race, and mm -hmm. and and the entire human race was half breeds, and you know many people believe that's where the Nephilim came from, or the giants in the land, and and that that is why the earth had to be destroyed by flood because it wasn't because um, God was wiping people out. It was because that there wasn't anybody left except Noah and his family that weren't touched by this. Mm. And so God was saving the human race from this because sex outside of God's context had polluted the entire yeah. human race. And then if you kind of read a little bit further on, it, it, it kind of happened again, but that's a story for another day. And so Satan's whole methodology has been to take this thing that God has created, which is meant to be an amazing expression of our covenant relationship with God, and it's supposed to be something that joins us together like glue yeah. forever, yes. right? Yes. How hard is it to break up with your first one? 
Yes. Versus to break up with your second one, your third one, your fourth one, your fifth one, yeah. right? That you always remember that first one because the glue that was meant to keep you together yeah. has been ripped apart. And so Satan continues to pollute the human race in this way. Nowadays, the new play, the new play is is to confuse sexual identity. Right. 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 And, and so it is just a it is a rebranding of the same playbook over and over again. And what its root causes is to get people sick in their spirits because that's where we are separated from God. And so one of the things that we have to realize is anything that can touch your spirit. Yeah. That profoundly and that deeply is different. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's not the same. That's good. That's good. While you were talking, um, I was thinking about how um, unintentionally science always confirms scripture. Always. And, you know, so there's this thing called pair bonding, right? And what, what, they, what they've said is that um, um, when people have, um, specifically the study was done on women, the more sexual partners women have, they have a lower chance of a successful marriage wow. because it, it damages their wow. ability to pair yes. bond oh, wow, 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 with wow. their partner. Wow. And so that's essentially what you're talking about right now. Oh, without a doubt. Matter of fact, what you were saying that, I don't know what this was, whether it was an animal or a bug, they mate for life. Yeah. What, does anybody you know? I've, you know I've heard that? of it before. You've heard of yeah, that yeah, before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and really that's, that's kind of like how God intended to be. So it's not like God comes along and is like, listen, I don't want you to have sex with other people because like I'm on a ra- ruin your life. Yeah. He's like, I want to, I don't want you to have sex outside of my context. One man, one woman within the confines of marriage because I don't want to ruin your life. That's right. Right. That's the thing that makes, and I think part of the reason why, especially in marriage, and we've been talking about, you know, um, infidelity and restoration, why it's so difficult is because very rare are the people who these days who have come together where both are virgins mm-hmm. at marriage time and they're sharing this with each other for the first time. Right. And so they're already dealing with strikes against them yes. because that, that parabonding that is supposed to be there is no longer there. So now they're having to come up with something on their own to really right. hold them together. When God in his master design has been like, listen, Hold out. I, pr- I know it's hard to hold out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, but, but let me tell you what, if, if you hold out, the yeah. bond that is going to be created for you and your spouse, and I think that's why sex and marriage sometimes peters out. Yeah, It peters out because, because it becomes old. Yeah. And, and it becomes old because, because it's not new. Right. And we're comparing to previous partners. Yes. There's all of these different things that are happening. We talked about this even last week when, when, when we're talking about the, some of the reasons around infidelity, right? Yes. And this is one of those things yes. because you are trying to, you know, have a, you know, have a, a, a rekindle, you know, something you experience with somebody else. Yes. And you're, you're charging that to your spouse yes. because they can't measure up yes. in this area. So yes. it's, 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 it's a whole thing. Do it God's way, guys. That's do the point God's of the story. Way. Do it, do it God, God's yes. way. So this, this, that was really, that was really awesome. Let's, let's, let's transition and switch gears here. Uh, we're going to move to our ask me anything segment. Whoa, whoa. And this is really cool. Uh, it's also a little dangerous too. Uh, but this is where you get to ask Pastor Frank anything. You can DM us. You can ask it in the comments. But we want to hear from you. All of us have, you know, faith and and spirituality and the Bible. It's such a mysterious um, um, book and a mysterious thing. And the Bible talks about that the mysteries of God are always unfolding, right? And 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 how we how we live that out in this world and, and how we walk that out today where there's so much um, mixing, right? Uh, and convolution. It touches every area of our life, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and, and those, those, you know, what the Bible calls mysteries are things that God wants us to uncover. You know, he, he wants us to mine the truth of the word of Amen. God so that our lives can be enriched by it. Yeah, that's good. So, so that's, that's, this is your cue to ask your questions. We want to hear from you um, so that we can uh, hopefully be a blessing and, and give you some, share yes. some light or give some insight on what you're, what you're um, going through. And, and now... Our and next now, segment is our good friend AI. We haven't given him a name yet. We haven't we, given him a name yet. We still we got a name. We got to put a timeline on this. Yes, so yes. I'm giving it um, maybe 
maybe 30 days, maybe maybe four episodes in. At, at the four episode in, we need to have a name because this is kind of like having a baby and, and like letting the baby live. And you don't give the baby a name. Like you, you got to name things after a while, right? Like, you know, who who has a baby and doesn't name? People don't know. I, I never, These people kind of drive me crazy. They, they they're, The baby is born. They're like, well, what should we name? Haven't you figured that yeah, out yet? Listen, What's listen. going on with Sometimes that? Sometimes you want to be surprised. You want to wait until well, you see it. You got to put eyes on it. Then you'll know it's a Bob. Listen, it's, a, it's a Billy. It's yeah, a... I guess. <laughs> it's an yeah, Elvis. These people kind of, these kind of people seem like Mary people, you know, Mary and Martha in the Bible, Mary people, you know what Mary people are? Mary people are people who are like carefree. I, I am so envious of Mary people sometimes like they, 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 they don't figure out stuff when they're supposed to figure it out. It's like, don't you have this? I haven't given this any thought. Or well, I would just take it as it comes. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely not. Doesn't the Bible, doesn't the Bible say give no thought for tomorrow? Oh, I guess it does. I guess it does. So anyway, um, four episodes in, we are naming um, our, our AI robot yeah. who is asking us uh, spontaneous questions. Uh, for the meantime, we have unofficially called him Ralph. Um, yeah. well, this is, my, my daughter's car is named Ralph also. By the really? Way. Yeah. It's a strange um, car, name lo- for a long car. Long story about that. My, my, my wife as, and her father would always name their vehicles. Okay. And so when, when I, my daughter got her car, my wife is like, we got to name him. And um, I can't tell you why we named him Ralph. Um, because it just, it's, it's not that it's inappropriate, but, but it was named, uh, I can't tell you why. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, we, we've got to give this, this thing a name anyway. All right. Well, listen, we've got a question and we're going to see what, uh, in the end from Ralph, the robot, what the question is for, for us today. Go ahead, Ralph. How should Christians address the idea of celebrity pastors, especially when it can seem like such figures prioritize personal fame or wealth over genuine spiritual leadership? Wow. Wow. That's deep. You go first. <laughs> and um, second. You know, for me, I can only talk at a, at a personal um, point of view. I think what, what a celebrity pastor to me is, is, is somebody who shows no care for the congregation. Um, I don't think it, it is a matter of, of size of the church. Um, or or influence of the church as, as some in the culture have espoused celebrity pastor to be. Um, because if we want to get biblical, and that's what the show is really all about, like this idea that Jesus preached to four people is just so biblically off base, it's not even funny. Um, the first parable Jesus ever told, I'm preaching on it, and just, you know, so I, I kind of study this stuff, Sunday. right? So it, it, the parable of the sower, I mean, the crowd that was waiting for him on the shore when he got out of the boat was so big. Yeah. It was huge. It was, the Bible calls it a great multitude. My good friend Rick Renner would break that down in the Greek. And it literally means more people than you can count. Mm-hmm. To the point where he could not get off of the boat. They, the crowd was pressing on him so bad. And that he stood in the boat and, and preached from the boat using the water to reflect his voice as a megaphone so that the crowd, which was so big, could hear it because they didn't have, you know, microphones like this yeah. in those days. So this whole idea that, like, you know, celebrity pastor, big mega church, it's, it's, so, it's so anti-biblical, no, it's really not. Mm-hmm. Matter of fact, the, the, the truth of the matter is if, if Jesus be lifted up, he'll draw all men onto him. Jesus is a draw, mm-hmm. okay? But, but I think that's where maybe the rub comes in. Jesus has got to be the draw. Yeah. And celebrity pastor for me is a, a pastor that, you know, preaches and forgive me if you do this, it's your business, not my business, I'm, but, but I was asked a question, so, so I'm answering it. Preaches, walks off the back of the stage, never interacts with the congregation, never hangs out with the congregation, you know, and I understand because our church is considered a mega church that there are a lot of demands and things like that, but, but never teaches Bible study, you know, never does any weddings, you know, it's not there for people during funeral times. And I understand you can't do all those kind of things. We have a, a staff of, I don't know, uh, I forget what it is, 10, 11, 12 pastors these days. And and everybody does all those kind of things. Um, but I think it really comes down to, do you care for the people? Mm-hmm. And if you care for the people, then it, whatever God does with your influence is what God does with your influence and the question becomes, are you using whatever influence God has given you for the glory of God and, and not for your own glory? Um, 
I think, though, we should have enough of a deep relationship with the Lord that we realize that God is entrusting us with whatever influence we have, not just to make our name great, but primarily to make his name great. Now, you can't help but the fact that people connect with people. And so God, in the covenant that he made with Abraham, said, I will make your name great. Yeah. He told Abraham that. Now, as somebody who is hopefully spiritually mature, if you're a pastor, you're realizing why that influence has been given to you. And so I think that um, as a person who's going to a church, what I would be looking for is, does the pastor care? Is there, is there, is there, is he touchable? Are they touchable? Um, you know, can, that, that doesn't mean like you can call them in the middle of the night. Like I had somebody one time, <laughs> that's a funny one time. They, they, they got my home number. They called me at four o'clock in the morning. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking this is, this is important. Right. And, and I, you know, nothing's good at four o'clock in Nothing. the morning. So I pick up the phone and I'm like, hello. And this person has since passed on. So I can, I can share this story. And they were a dear, dear uh, person, member of our church for a long time. One of the mothers of the church. And, and she said, Pastor Frankie. She called me Pastor Frankie. My, only my family calls me Frankie. I'm, I'm not Frankie. Anyway, she said, Pastor Frankie, I was just wondering, why don't we blow the shofar in church? <laughs> That's a 4 a.m. question. <laughs> I, thought, I thought maybe this was a dream. Like maybe, maybe this was a real phone call. Like, like. That's not what I mean, is the pastor accessible, is the pastor touchable, right? I mean, you have to have boundaries because, you know, as a pastor, like, I I have a life too. Like, I want to spend, can I just be honest with you? I want to spend more time with my family than I do with you. Mm -hmm. Now, my family sometimes has to sacrifice because I'm a pastor. I have to be there with the people. But I think the heart of anybody who's going to a church should not be, how big is this church? How small is this church? First of all, the first question you ought to ask yourself, right, is, is this a church God wants me in? You right, should be led by the Lord. But to, to judge whether you're going to a church based upon big or small, I don't know if that's really the, the, the right biblical way to approach it. And I know there's a lot of haters out there. And usually the haters out there are people who are not part of mega churches or tried to have a big church but couldn't get a big church, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or wish that God gave them one, but they never, they never have one. So there's a lot of hater aid that gets yeah. drug in, in the process. But I think it should be, does God want me there? Then it should be, if, if this is going to be my pastor, okay, um, are they and the pastoral team? And, and that's the other question, right? The pastoral team. Because one of the things that, um, that I realize is that I'm one person. And the same Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of me is the same Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of the other pastors that are on staff. And the same advice that I can give them is that is the same advice that they can get if they go to some of the other pastors. And we're here to serve the people in whichever way we can. And so if that means can't meet with one of us, but can meet with another one of us, not because we're out on a yacht, we're out on a boat, we're out on a golf, but because we're serving other people. Once right. you get to a certain number of people, one person can't do it anymore, right? That's why Jesus had how many disciples? Yeah, 12. 12, right? And uh, Jesus sent those disciples out, and they also ministered right. you know, to, to people as well. So, so we have to kind of keep that in context. And so I think that's how you deal with this quote unquote celebrity pastor stuff. Yeah, I think that's good. I think that's good. I want to push back just a little bit. Don't push back. <laughs> I don't like to be pushed. Listen, we got to push back for the, so the people can you know have their their perspectives considered. Um, but but I do think that there are people uh, inside of the church as well as outside of the church that have um, from their position they're turned off from church because they do feel like. Um, Pastors like that is the pursuit. Like they are, they're they're flashy and they're and they're got the, their, their big homes and they want you to see their big home. It's almost like MTV Cribs and they do the right. same little sort of thing. I want you right. to see that I am, you know. So how does how does a believer who wants to be a part, who wants to get plugged into a church community, but is kind of seeing aspects of this yep. f- from anointed teachers, from anointed yeah, yeah, yeah. gifted leaders? You know, they're seeing that sort of same, um, you know idea of, of wealth and being being a pri- being more of a priority yeah so um first of all like um uh this whole idea like of you know anointing going with stuff it, it, they're incongruent with one another right mm-hmm. like you don't have to have stuff to be anointed absolutely right? so like um so that for me is like you know doesn't doesn't compute however the other th- on the other side of the coin is that it, it should never be about the pursuit of stuff 
right? Never, never about the pursuit of stuff. But, but my Bible tells me that if I pursue God, God's going to automatically add to my life. That's a scriptural principle for not just pastors, it's a scriptural principle for everyone. Yeah. The other thing we have to look at is like somehow, some way people have gotten, and there have been excesses and abuses and, and all of that kind of stuff. We understand that. But, but we also have to get down to brass tacks. What does the Bible have to say? Does the Bible or doesn't the Bible say that God ha- is the one who gives us the power to get wealth to establish his covenant, right? So that means that God is not mad at wealth. God is not angry with wealth. Um, God doesn't not want us to have wealth. Proverbs, I think uh, Psalm 35 verse 27 says, God delights in the prosperity of his people, right? Um, uh, 3 John 2, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, be in health, even as thy soul prospers. So cle- the Bible is clear. I mean, we can go on and on and on about this subject, but the Bible is clear about God wanting to prosper his servants, mm-hmm. okay? And, and according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, mm-hmm. right? I'll meet all your needs according to my riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Well, according to means ba- based upon what I have, that's how I meet your needs. Mm-hmm. So that's not just like a, like just basically give you a, you know, a ham sandwich and, and, a, and, and, and that's how I meet your needs. Yeah. Thank God for ham sandwiches, right? When you're hungry, a ham sandwich is great. Right. But what God is basically saying is that I'm a big God. I enjoy blessing my people. I enjoy my people to be prosperous. That should be my servants. Yep. Right, who who serve me, but it also should be anybody who follows me. That is the will of God for our lives. Here's where the rub happens. We don't pursue those things, right? And 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 really, that's the heart of the issue: is that are we living for these things, or that those are the things that we base our life and our decisions on is, is, are those are the, is that the reason why we are preaching a particular thing is because we, we are looking to enrich ourselves is, is if that's the heart, the heart is way wrong on those areas in every single way. And so for me, it's not a really a matter of how much somebody has because, and I've said this before, like, Everybody in America, by virtue of the world standards, is, 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 is rich. Mm-hmm. Who gets to determine where the level of rich stops? Like, if I drive a bicycle, the person who can't afford a bicycle and walks thinks I'm rich. Sure. If I drive a, a hoopty, you all y'all know what a hoopty <laughs> is, right? If I drive a hoopty. A jalopy, for those yeah, of you that may not uh, know. <laughs> the, the, the person who's driving a bicycle who can't afford a hoopty, they, they, they think I'm rich. Yeah. If, if I drive a, a new car that is, you know, nowadays a new car, just any new car. Yeah. I don't know, 35, 40,000 bucks for any new car, right? If I drive that kind of car, the, the person who's driving the hoop, hoopty thinks I'm rich. Okay, right. Where do we stop here? Right. Who gets to say that we are only allowed to drive hoopties? Mm-hmm. And and if you drive anything in excess of a hoopty, you are somehow unspiritual or ungodly. The issue is not the amount of stuff. Yeah. It is just not the amount of stuff. The issue is does the stuff have you? Right. Right. And and here's the test. Okay, I'm getting ready. All all the haters are getting ready to really hate me now. The test is do you tithe? Mm. That's the test. Because a tithe is not to enrich the church, although it supplies the needs of the church. It's not to enrich the past. It's to honor God. That's the pur- purpose for it. And it's to protect our hearts against the more monsters and the monsters of greed. And so somebody who has nothing but won't tithe, to me, has a bigger problem than somebody who has everything and does tithe. So, so for me, and I'm a little passionate about this. Um, a little, little bit. A little passionate with about this. With all the this. hoopties. You know, hoopty. we, Who gets a hoopty? You yeah. got a hoopty. Everybody's got a hoopty. You and, drive a hoopty. And it's like, it's like, okay, how do we explain things? Like if God doesn't want to bless us, again, the, the issue is not do we have money. The issue is does money have us, right? Yeah. God doesn't want to bless us. Can you explain heaven to me? Somebody please explain heaven to me. Right. Like, why do we have streets of gold in heaven if, if God doesn't want to bless his people? Why are they there? Why is it even in the scripture? Why is it a point in the scripture yeah. to say this? Why is the sea crystal? Yeah. Why are the, why are the foundations? Why do we wear a crown? <laughs> yeah, why do we wear, Well, we cast them at the feet of Jesus, yeah. right? But why are the foundations precious stones? Why? You know, why? Why? It's inconceivable to me for somebody who's honestly dealing with the scripture to to say that the issue is God doesn't want to prosper his servants. 
That's not the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue is how are we handling it? Right. How do we deal with it? We can do a whole segment, a whole teaching on this. People will chime in with stupidity and say that, that well, Jesus was poor. No, he wasn't. Um, the disciples were poor. No, they weren't. Okay, even if you think they were poor, how do you explain Abraham? Yeah. How do you explain Solomon? How do you explain David, who, when it was time to build the temple of God, by the way, right, for Solomon, David and his mighty men led the way. And if you read the actual numerical value of what David had in his own personal, but he was the king, yeah, but he was a servant of God. Who put right. him there? Right. God put him there. Who right. prospered him? God prospered him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so for me, um, you know, some people are stupid with it. <laughs> no, Let's put it out there. On, on both sides, right? Some people are stupid with it on some, some ministers are stupid with it. Um, and, you know, and, and then some people on the other side. Can we, just, can we just stick with what the Bible has to say mm -hmm. about the subject and kind of let that be how we, how, we, how we live our lives? That's good. That's good. And, and I think to that point, what you're talking about is basically I have to trust the Spirit of God in me to lead me to a ministry, to a pastor, to a leader who is after God's own heart. Yeah. And what shoes he wears, what car he drives, what house he lives in, what community right. he lives in, all of that is inconsequential. Um, I should be pursuing the, the, right. the not the pastor, right. but the passion of, of, of Christ right. in that way. So, Amen. Yeah, that's good. So again, this is this is really good, Ralph. That was a great question. Thank you so much. Go uh, Ralph. <laughs> go Ralph. Listen, guys, we're gonna wrap it up and get out of here. But thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll be back next week with another great, great, great time.